third module is uh, everything you always wanted to know about how to participate in the California Bumblebee Atlas. It's about 50 slides. And as I said, I'm going to try to move quickly to catch us up a bit, but um, this is the how-to, this is the methods for the project. All of these methods are also described on our website, uh, cabumblebeeatlas.org, as well as in the participant handbook or manual, which you'll, uh, you can download from the website, but we'll also uh, talk about a bit. Um, so don't worry if you miss something in these slides, um, you can find it again on the website or in the manual. Uh, and so again, this is, a, this is meant to be a 60 minute module followed by a lunch break, followed by our final uh, module about identification. So here's our current understanding of where bumblebees occur in the state of California. All of these dots represent observations or specimen collections of bumblebees through the last 100, 125 or more years. The gray dots are our historic collections or observations and the orange dots are, are more recent. Uh, it's the last 20 years. And I just want you to see two things here, or maybe three. First of all, there have been a lot of collections or observations of bumblebees in California. So you may wonder why do we need any more? Um, the second thing, uh, the orange dots are only partly overlapping of the gray, the gray dots. So you can see that either bumblebees have changed their uh, distribution somewhat, or we humans have changed the distribution of our observation making. And um, so, and then we also have large gaps in the map where we have no collections. Uh, for example, the southern uh, end of the San Joaquin Valley, so there's no, we have absolutely no observations. And this is not because bumblebees have never occurred there. It's actually uh, just a, a, it's not a great habitat for bees now, but uh, bumblebees do occur there. We just haven't had collections. Uh, areas of the north are similar. And then um, I'll just say for the Mojave, uh, southeastern California, there aren't a lot of bumblebees in the low desert, and that, that explains the gap there. Uh, but I hope you'll see that there is an important need for more uh, surveying and more of a uh, standardized, stratified collection, not just the sort of haphazard collecting that, that, we, that is the result of uh, all of this work over more than a century. So enter the California Bumblebee Atlas. In this project, we intend to, to work with you, the volunteers, to survey bees in a stratified way. So in these grid cells, the grid cells are uh, 50 kilometers by 50 kilometers. So they are large areas, as you can clearly see in the map. Um, and what we're going to do is ask you to adopt one of these cells. And you can do that on the website uh, on the page called Adopt a Grid Cell. And so basically, you'll use an interactive mapping tool to select your favorite spot on the map. Uh, maybe it's the grid cell you live in and it's your backyard you want to work in, or it's a particular natural area that you have access to. Um, uh, where you want to do your work. Um, in this image, you can see that I've divided those cells into three periods, and those are the launch dates for our work, roughly structured around when bees become active in the state. And you may be aware that bumblebees are already flying in lots of places, especially along the coast, all the way up the coast. Um, we intentionally are trying to have you not start work when those newly emerged queens are flying and looking for nest sites. This is a sensitive time of life for bumblebees and we really wanna catch, we wanna collect data when the, the worker cast is out flying and the most number of species are out flying. And so that's, that explains the timing just a bit. But uh, so if you live in Southern California in those blue areas, we expect uh, to, we, we encourage you to start your work as early as March 15th. And, um, and then you can see that much of the Central Valley and the coast, Central and Northern coast, we're saying April 15th, and then Montaigne and Northern areas, May 15th would be the time to start the work. Uh, this is what the map looks like when you zoom, zoom in on it. And here I'm showing that each cell has a unique number associated with it. So you'll select CA 192 or 197, depending on your interest. And this is the San Diego area. The, uh, the uncolored, the gray background um, cells, those are cells that we have, uh, that we're not emphasizing in the collecting this year. We randomly selected a subset of the total number of cells. So we encourage you to work in one of the cells that is in this image is green um, rather than in those other places. However, we would be um, happy to have data from the, the, the gaps, uh, you know, if you're in those areas. And I'll talk more about how that works in a minute. 
Um, I do have to give you one caveat that is a piece of late breaking news. Uh, this week we learned that we won't be able to start collecting in certain areas of Northern California until we have a federal scientific recovery permit in hand for the project for Franklin's bumblebee, which was listed as endangered last summer by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. This is our probably our rarest bumblebee species. It actually hasn't been seen since 2006. It may be extinct. It is very important that we relocate it. So this project uh, is one of the goals of the project is to relocate this species. However, we just can't start the work in those areas until we have permission. And so you can, you're free to select these orange cells if that's where you want to work. But just know that you won't be able to collect there until we have this permit. And um, you will hear from me. Uh, you'll, get, you'll get that notification uh, as to when you can work there. Um, but basically, you'll adopt a grid cell, you'll collect data as in, in the way that I'll, I'll describe in just a second, and then you will upload that data to bumblebeewatch.org, which is our data management uh, platform. So how are we going to find these bees on the landscape? Well, generally speaking, um, it's nice to hear that we don't have to kill the bees. Uh, that is generally how entomology works. People take specimens, they get pinned, they live in a drawer in a museum and they're studied over the years. In this project, uh, although we don't think that collection of actual vouchers, as we call them, is destructive to the whole population, um, we don't have to do that. We are uh, catching and releasing bumblebees after photographing them. Um, there is value to these museum specimen records. In fact, there's, a, there's great value to them. Yeah, uh, so um, taking those vouchers can be a good idea. It is something that is possible, but uh, we are not asking of that of you. So uh, don't feel like um, killing bees is part of the work in any way for you. So how do we find these bees? Uh, well, we're gonna find a piece of good habitat within your survey area, within your grid cell. Um, and we'll talk a lot about what good habitat constitutes in a minute. Um, and I'll encourage you to be flexible about trying different places, um, uh, dropping your assumptions for a minute, something I have to do as a professional who's been doing this for many years. Uh, everyone has to sort of put away their preconceptions about where to find bees and, and try to new things as they're out on the landscape. Um, but basically you'll establish a survey area. You will spend a, uh, a prescribed period of time looking for and capturing bumblebees on flowers in that area. It's a net of 45 minutes, no pun intended. Um, and those bees that you catch, you'll stop your watch, you'll uh, put them in a cooler of ice or ice packs. Then at the end of your collecting period, those bees will be anesthetized. And one by one, you'll pull them from the cooler, you will photograph them, collect some more information about them and, and they'll warm up and fly off. Um, we'll then collect some data about the, the habitats that are found in the survey area. And um, uh, this is not the last time that I will tell you taking good notes is very important um, because it can sometimes be weeks until you are able to upload your data to Bumblebee Watch and you may forget something. So as you'll see, good notes are important. So what sorts of habitats should you be looking for? Uh, well, here's a picture of Rich standing in, in uh, A plus habitat. <laughs> Um, we, uh, these open flowering meadows or grasslands can be just wonderful places to look. So, so montane meadows in the Sierra Nevada or the Siskiyous or Klamaths, uh, the grasslands of coastal central California are wonderful. Um, sage scrub habitats of Southern California are fantastic places for a smaller subset of the total number of bumblebees that occur here. Uh, wetlands can be very important uh, because they have so many flowering plants in them. Uh, we also see bumblebees in open forest habitats and a variety of other habitats I haven't mentioned. I guess most importantly, I should say in developed areas, um, human dominated areas, we can sometimes find nice populations of the more common species. And so don't be dissuaded from uh, trying your luck in your local uh, city park or something like that. Uh, some of those places can be very good for uh, flowers that attract bumblebees. When should you do your work? Well, I've I've shown you the map uh, that lays out when we can start working in the various places. But generally speaking, uh, in Southern California, as I said, the bees are already flying, but we want you to start in mid-March. Uh, central and coastal range areas in the Central Valley 
um, maybe starting in April and going through August, and then in Northern California in the mountains, May through September. And this will of course depend on the degree of drought we're experiencing, elevation, and other aspects of weather. So what do you need to take with you in the field? Well, here's a short list of equipment that you'll need. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one nice thing about this community science project is it's low tech. Uh, there isn't a lot of fancy gadgetry you need to understand or carry with you. Um, surveying for bees is a somewhat, um, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's very simple. You, you have a net, uh, you have, you're gonna take some notes. Um, you need a cooler for this method that we'll describe here. You need vials that the bees will go into. Uh, you certainly need a camera of some sort for this project. Uh, you can get by with your, with your cell phone. Um, you can learn to take wonderful photographs with an iPhone, for example, uh, but you do need to play around with it and figure out how to use it as a macro camera. Um, if you are inclined and able, uh, you might consider buying a better camera that you dedicate for this project. Um, uh, so a better camera that has the ability to take macro photos might be a nice thing to do. Um, we want you to take care of your personal um, um, well-being and, and safety in the field. So all the usual sorts of things you do when you go outside, such as using sunscreen and avoiding snakes. Um, uh, keep yourself uh, found using a GPS or perhaps a smartphone app. Uh, the latter is my preference. I use one called uh, Gaia, G-A-I-A. Um, just a wonderful uh, app that uh, tells you where on earth you are and, and keeps you from getting lost. Um, so those are, the, those are the basics of materials that you'll need. Now, we have three types of surveys that we want you to consider for this project. The first one, and the most important, if you choose to do this, this is the, the most valuable data for us. It's, we call it a point survey. You will collect data in a particular site, uh, a point. Um, that site should be roughly one hectare in size, which is equivalent to about two and a half acres. Uh, so you can figure out uh, how big that area should be. We're not asking you to use tapes and, and figure out precisely what one hectare is. You can eyeball it. Uh, but, but we do want uh, you to survey in a distinct and discreet area, okay, about a hectare. As I said, it's 45 minutes of, of work. That can be 45 minutes by you, the individual, or if you're working with another volunteer, each of you could do 22 and a half minutes. Uh, we want a net of 45 person minutes, and that excludes the time it takes to get the bees out of the net, put the bee in the vial, put the bee in the, the vial in the cooler, all of that stuff. So whatever timing device you're using, be it a watch, your phone, or something else, you will stop that timer, um, you'll process your bee, put it in the cooler, and then you can start the timer again. Um, point surveys take place within that grid cell, and um, they involve a thorough habitat assessment after you collect your bees, or before if you prefer. Uh, a, a related survey type is the roadside survey. This is more of a linear survey that you'll do through one of those grid cells. Uh, obviously, it is a roadside survey. You're driving a road uh, roughly 10 miles, and we want you to stop five times at half mile inter intervals. Uh, each of those surveys is much shorter. It's 15 minutes of bee catching, not 45. And so total, you're doing, um, you're doing more surveys, uh, more time of surveys, but at five discrete uh, shorter um, surveys. And you'll do a, a, a habitat assessment at each of those sites. There's a third type of survey, an incidental survey. These are not the most important type of survey for you to do. However, we wanna encourage them. Um, an incidental survey, anytime you photograph a bumblebee in any context, um, we would love to have you upload that photo to our website and that becomes, uh, uh, it's our website being bumblebeewatch.org, that becomes a record of a bee. It has less information and thus less value to us as um, a statement of where a bee occurs um, and how common the bees are in that area. But it, an incidental survey is an absolutely acceptable way to participate in the project. And um, it's, it, you should try to do one of the other types of surveys. And then you also do incidental surveys when you're, uh, when you're on your way to the grocery store or what have you, and you see a bee and you have your phone in your pocket. More depth on each of these. So for point surveys, uh, the, they're beneficial because they're longer. Uh, we, we encounter more surveys the longer we, uh, sorry, more species the longer we survey. 
to catch rare species or uncommon species in a, in a place, the longer you survey, the more likely you are to find them. Um, we get more detailed information about those places, about the habitats, uh, and there are fewer logistics. You don't have to be getting in and out of your car repeatedly. Um, the, the drawbacks of point surveys, it's just one location within that 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer grid cell. Um, and you may miss species that uh, they don't nest in the immediate vicinity of that, that single location that you chose to survey in. How do we go about planning a point survey? Well, uh, as with all of these different methods, we want you to take care of your own personal safety first. So um, do what you need to do to think about getting safely to the site, having legal um, access to the land and um, avoiding natural hazards such as sunburn and uh, rattlesnakes and other things. Um, you should uh, do a little planning before you go out. Select more than one location within your grid cell that you think might be good based on aerial photos you can see on say Google Earth or Google Maps or other mapping services, uh, perhaps other types of likely habitat um, and be flexible once you're out there. Uh, and uh, just make sure that someone knows where you've gone and when to expect you home. So in these point surveys, how do we look for those bees? So you get to your spot, you decide you were right. This is a, a mountain meadow and it has flowers and it looks great. Um, we want you to think about doing a minimum of two repeated surveys within your grid cell. So those could be two surveys on different dates in that same wonderful mountain meadow, or they could be two surveys on the same day in different meadows, different places, uh, different parks, whatever it would be. Um, okay, uh, so a minimum of two surveys in the cell during 2022. Um, each of those individual surveys is 45 person minutes long, as I described. Um, and the time is, is search time only. So uh, stop your watch or your phone uh, timer for those tasks, such as transferring these to the cooler and taking notes. Um, so getting onto the roadside surveys, uh, they're wonderful because they give us greater spatial distribution through the grid cell across the landscape. Um, you will go through different habitats, uh, so we'll get more information, generally speaking, and access is not much of a problem, right? The roads are public uh, thoroughfares, and you can pull over safely, and you can do your surveys. Um, they, the, one of the problems with them is that the plants that grow along the roadsides sometimes are, are more likely to be non-native species. And that's not a problem necessarily for bumblebees, but it will bias which bumblebees you see. And um, we're primarily interested in documenting the interaction between bumblebees and the native plants that they, that they have always depended on here. Um, so roadside surveys will skew a little bit towards those invasive plants. Um, and then those surveys are shorter. They're 15 minutes instead of 45. And as I said earlier, you just won't catch the rarest species if you don't work um, for the particular events of time. So with those roadside surveys, of course, we want you to be safe. And here we'll add all of the precautions that come along with motor vehicles and standing on sides of roads where other people are driving. So please think carefully about uh, keeping yourself safe with these types of surveys. Um, again, do your planning indoors, look at maps, uh, look for places that you think you can probably safely pull off the road. Don't try to do this on freeways, right? Um, the, the, the rustic back roads are wonderful places to do this sort of work. You have some of the you know, safety concerns are less important. Um, again, remain flexible. You may need to drive the whole route once and see what you see, and then you'll go back and, and go to the places you've identified as good places to, to survey. Of course, we want you to respect uh, private property and other property um, um, ownership and, and all local regulations. And again, uh, just keep someone else apprised of your plans. So these roadside surveys, as I said, are about 10 miles long with stops every roughly every half mile. So that's five stops. They are 15 minute surveys. And again, that is, that is net catching time. So 15 net minutes of catching time, uh, net, net time. And uh, you will stop your timer for the transferring of bees to vials and coolers and such. And of course, for the driving between your sites. Finally, those incidental surveys, 
Um, these are the easiest surveys to pull off, except that your bees are not chilled. So your photographs are a little bit harder to obtain. And we will talk uh, in depth about how to photograph bees um, in a minute here. Um, these are casual or opportunistic surveys where you know, you're taking a dog walk or you're, um, you're hanging out with friends or whatever you might be doing and you see a bumblebee or something you think is a bumblebee. And you have an opportunity, you take a photo or uh, several photos and um, uh, that can constitute a, a wonderful, very valuable observation um, that goes into our database and helps us understand the status of, of that species of bumblebee. Again, uh, the photos are a little trickier to take because the bees may fly away when they see you. Um, we do have some good tips on how to do this on our website and you'll be getting some tips uh, shortly here from me. Um, so these incidental observations obviously are less time consuming. Uh, when I'm on a, on a hike and I'm, my, my priority is hanging out with my uh, co-hikers, I, I will uh, take bee photos as often as I can get away with, but I'm not going to sit down and take field, uh, detailed field notes about the habitats and that sort of thing. So you can amass a lot of data in this way, but it's, it's got less resolution to it. Um, there's also some bias there, right? I choose to go to the particular park and therefore that is the universe of possibilities where the, the bee can be observed, as opposed to me choosing a grid cell in a more standardized fashion. So um, let's talk about how to document bees. So, uh, so how to photograph your bees. Well, here are a few uh, pieces of advice about how to do that. We want a photo that shows the hind leg of a bumblebee. And um, this will help us to distinguish the cuckoo bumblebees, also known as Scytheris, this word starting with a silent P. <laughs> um, it will help us distinguish males and females. Um, it's very important to get a good photo of the head, especially what we call the face, the front part of the head. Um, we call the top part of the head the vertex. That it can also be an important part. So a picture directly to, uh, head on or from the side of the head um, that clearly shows the color of the hair on the head is important. Um, the color of the abdomen, which is that next segment, the middle segment of the body, and of course the color of the uh, sorry, the thorax, and then the color of the abdomen, the back segment of the body. Um, there are particular species of bees where we want more information, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the fourth module, but as an example, if the bee that you see has a yellow face and a single yellow stripe on the abdomen, um, this one has a single, uh, this one does not classify. You see several yellow stripes on the abdomen, um, and the hair on the face is probably black for the most part. Anyway, in that case, we would want, it's important that we would get a picture of the underside of the abdomen also. So as you go through this, you'll start to learn that for certain bees, we want a photo that we may not need for other bees. But generally speaking, we need photos of the head, the thorax, the abdomen, um, and that hind leg, and um, photos from both the sides, the top, and the front of the bee can all be valuable. Uh, safe handling procedures. Um, this is mainly about keeping the bees safe, not us, but uh, we, we encourage you to sterilize or at least clean your, your vials uh, between collecting missions. Uh, this is to reduce that transmission of pathogens between field sites. We can actually, as volunteers and uh, professionals in this space, we can actually cause problems for bumblebees by moving their diseases around the landscape as we do this good work. So uh, when you're done with your field surveys for the weekend or whatever you do, uh, I would encourage you to wash those vials. You can do this with a 10% bleach solution. I like to soak my vials in cold 10% bleach in the sink for a while, then dry them, uh, set them out to dry. Uh, you can also use 70% ethanol uh, or hydrogen peroxide. Very hot soapy water is better than nothing at all, but it may not kill all of those viruses. Um, we're going to limit bees' times in the vials at ambient temperature. So once you've caught the bee and it's in the vial, I encourage you to not stuff that in your pocket and forget about it. Go back to your cooler and put it on ice. Uh, these bees can live uh, literally for weeks in a chilled environment. They cannot live more than a few minutes in direct sunlight at ambient temperature. That said, we do not want you to keep them in the cooler for weeks. We want you to keep them in the cooler for no longer than 90 minutes. Um, this is a good general guideline that will protect bees from mortality that's unnecessary. 
And then uh, as uh, Rich described, we will be releasing the bees relatively close to the actual capture location. So usually within a hundred meters of where you caught the bee. What this means functionally is you, in your one hectare or your two and a half acre survey area, you walk around and you collect your data, you collect your bees, you go back to your, your headquarters, your cooler where you've put all your, your gear and you can release the bees there. And they're, they're just across the field. They're very close to where you actually caught them and that is close enough. So more about how to photograph these bees. So uh, we'll get a, more, a little bit more specific. So for the head, it's the front of that face and then the top of the head, which I called the vertex. And you can clearly see both parts of the head in the photo in the upper right hand corner here, which I think is Bombus fervidus. Um, uh, and there's, this diagram should also show you, there's the, the head and in this picture, this diagram, you can see that the, the hair between the antenna uh, on the front face of the, the head is black. The hair on the top of the head is yellow. That's again, the vertex. So sometimes we need to see both parts of the, the, the hair color in both of those places. Uh, for the thorax, um, we, that's the middle segment, right? Where the wings are attached. Um, we wanna see uh, distinctly on the top of the thorax, there are usually three different areas, the front part, the middle part, and the back part. And we typically wanna see the hair color in all of those places. So in this picture, shot from the side and a little from above, we can see all of that, right? We see a bee with a yellow band in the front of the thorax, a strong black band across the middle, and then a yellow band in the back up against the abdomen. Um, there are some other details. For example, sometimes that black color on the top of the thorax will bleed into the, the, the distal or, or back part of yellow hair on the thorax. We would like to see that. Some of the species we need to see that to identify to distinguish it from another species. Um, the character of the black band across the top uh, is important. Is it an oval? Is it a rectangle? Is it a narrow rectangle? Is it a spot? Is it absent? These are all characters that can help us to identify the bees. So try to get a good, good sense in your photos of what the color of the hair in the center top part of the thorax is. Um, once in a while, this is very important for some species, we, we need to see the hair under the wing base. So if you see in that photo where the wings are attached, there is hair below that on the side, the vertical face of the thorax. Um, for some species, we need to see whether that's all yellow, it's yellow and black, it's all black. So a side photo of this sort um, can accomplish that. And then for the abdomen, we want to know what is the color of each segment of the abdomen. And the segments have a technical term, a technical name, and that is they are called turga. The singular is turgum, and we abbreviate that with a T here. So for female bees, there are six turga in the abdomen, T1 through T6, as in the diagram there. For male bumblebees, there are actually seven of these, but we'll set that aside for now. Um, and we wanna see the color of the hair on each of these, including in the central or medial part of the back of the abdomen, as well as on the sides of the abdomen. So here, it might be good to get a photo from directly above, a photo from the side of the abdomen also. Um, so we're gonna be looking for things like mixture of black and yellow hairs on a segment, uh, whether the hairs from one segment overlap another segment or stand up straight, um, and things like of this sort. So each segment of the abdomen will be important for identification. After you've taken your lovely photos and before you upload your data, you're gonna to wanna to look at your photos and delete some of them. Um, I typically take, let's say I take 10 photos. I may have two good ones. I may have only one good one. Um, it's important for you to review your work in the field. And if, you, if necessary, go and take more photos. You're going to need to control for uh, light. If it's a bright sunny day and you're, and you're putting the bee on a white piece of paper, the uh, light balance will be off. And you'll get a dark image like the one on the right where we can't clearly see where the black hair starts and where the yellow hair starts. Um, what we're really going for is a beautiful, well-lit photo like the one on the left. Um, even though that's a, just a great photo, you know, there's some areas on the, on the lower part of the thorax and abdomen where I can't clearly see the color. So um, review your work. Uh, see if it's out of focus, see if um, the hair colors are, are vibrant and sort of true to life, and take more photos if necessary. And, and we have many more uh, uh, pieces of advice on the website 
um, to help you take those great photos in the field. Uh, don't worry about your fingers showing up or your pen or whatever. Uh, it is absolutely fine to have, have other stuff in the photo. We just wanna see that be as well as we can. Now let's talk a little about how you record your data. So when you're in the field, um, we're not using a digital data capture method. You may have used something like Survey123 in the past if you've worked on other community science projects. We want you to take paper into the field and write on it. Uh, so here is what the, the Bumblebee data sheet looks like for this. And this is included in the manual. It's also downloadable from the website directly. So we'll start by filling in some survey and weather information. And here I have done that. Um, so you, I just chose a spot in the town of Dixon and um, made a fake record here. Uh, I noted it was great habitat, but very dry and few bees seen. You can see that I have the temperature and the wind speed, the number of observers. It was just me and I put my name in there. And then just below, you see it says bumblebee observations and I've written in each of my bees. So in this example, I'm saying that in my 45 minute point survey, I found three bees. I took them out of my cooler one by one. I photographed each one. And uh, I think I have these three species, Bombus fervidus. I have a second bee that's Bombus vosnesenskii and a third, which is Bombus crotchii. And I've recorded the host plant. Uh, you can see that I've used different notations here. So you can use the common name to record your bumblebee species if you like. You can use the scientific name as I have here. Uh, for host plants, you can write, uh, you know, yellow flower sea photo. You can write lupinus if you know the genus. You can write lupin if you just know the common name. Do your best to record the actual plant species. Um, but let me hasten to say that for both the plants and the bees, your primary goal is not to tell us what species you saw. It is to uh, take good photos of the bees that you saw and upload the data to the website. And then we will come through and validate your identifications. So I want you to learn to identify bumblebees to whatever extent you wanna chase that. Um, it's very enriching to learn to identify these insects, but it is not your primary goal. You, you wanna get good data and get it into Bumblebee Watch. And so I, I don't want you to feel um, nervous about seeing these scientific names here. You don't have to know what Bombus, Bombus fervidus looks like or how to spell its last name. Um, we just want, want you to collect good data about that, that bee. So the other thing about this slide, if you look on the right, uh, bottom right side, you see I have photo numbers slash timestamp. So it's important that uh, later when you are trying to upload your data, you're able to identify which photos you took go with which line of the data in this table. So my Bombus, Bombus fervidus, I wrote photo number 127. So you can do this in different ways. If you are a person who has um, a camera that puts a, a, a number on the, on the photo, you could record the photo each time like that. Um, maybe you took three photos. And so for the next one up there, I say photo number 128 through 130. Personally, whether I use my phone or my nice camera for taking photos of bees, I find it's easiest to record the minute that I took the photo, the first photo of that bee. So for this one that I called Bombus crotchii on Penstemon, I say the first photo was at 2.34 p.m. So three weeks later, when it's time to upload my data to Bumblebee Watch, I can go into my photo library, find the date, find 2.34 p.m. And lo and behold, there is that bee. And I see, oh, I took five photos in the next two minutes. Um, so you need to come up with a, a system for that that works for you. And you will find that if you don't have a good system for marrying photos to written records, it's a real headache um, and you can end up making mistakes. And, and so just pay attention to the importance of recording which photos go with which feet. So that's the bumblebee habitat form. There is a second field form, there are only two. This is the habitat data form. And so you have to do both of these for a point survey or for a roadside survey. So I'm again on Pedrick Road in Dixon, and here I am recording some of the same site information at the top, but then we're going in and recording a bunch of information about the type of habitat that we had. So I'm saying this was an agricultural field. As you can see, I've circled agricultural field there, and then farther down the same form, same side of this form, 
we ask you, did you see any evidence of nesting habitat? And that would include bunch grasses and rodent holes, brush piles, bare soil, and so on. You just X, put an X for any of those habitat features you, you can readily observe in your hectare uh, survey area. And then uh, do you see evidence of these forms of management or natural disturbance or non-natural disturbance? Is there agriculture? Did you see insecticide use? Do you suspect um, that fire took place there? Uh, and, and we wanna know how many honey beehives you see at that location, if you see any. Um, this is not, do you see honeybees? It's, do you see honeybee hives? And I've said there were 39 honeybee hives here. Um, we would really like to know if you see honeybees at all, but that, this is specifically about hives, uh, not, not honeybees. So if, if you want, you can note, you can record in a notes field as I have here, saw many honeybees. Or you could say, I saw 55 honeybees if you wanna keep track. It's not essential, but if you do see honeybees, I think it's valuable information for us to understand what the habitat was like. Um, and then finally, in this habitat form, we wanna know how many plants were in bloom and then we want you to record the most important ones here. So again, this is a little bit like recording the bumblebee data. You'll, you'll record either the uh, common name or the, the scientific name or both if you know them. And then you are gonna take photos of them. And again, we need a, a photo number or, or a timestamp. And um, you can take up to five photos. You can submit up to five photos. And so one of these should be one of the plant and the other four would be for the bee that you caught from that plant. Okay, so you've, co you've collected bee data, you've collected habitat data, you've gone home, and um, hopefully you will shortly then enter your data to Bumblebee Watch. The sooner you do it, the easier it will be on you and the more accurately you will do so. So uh, you'll go to bumblebeewatch.org. You need to uh, sign up for an account, and I'm gonna lead you through how data gets entered here. So, um, um, so I think I've covered the rest of the material on this slide. Here's what our website looks like on the landing page. So you'll sign in and then you'll click record a sighting here. You will choose bumblebee sighting, unless this is a nest that you saw, but we're, we're doing bumblebee work here. So let's say that you're gonna choose bumblebee sighting. And then um, there it is. You will then get to this page called bumblebee sighting. The first thing you'll do is specify the project name right here. And you'll see that I've uh, populated that with a drop down menu um, that included California Bumblebee Atlas. That is the name of our project. Uh, one exception if you're doing incidental survey work, you will select instead the project called Bumblebee Watch. And this is just because if you choose California Bumblebee Atlas, you get a different set of, um, of fields that you must fill in, as opposed to with an incidental sighting. Uh, if you choose Bumblebee Watch, it's fewer fields. And so, um, that is the exception. Um, all of the data will end up in the, the California Bumblebee Atlas. So don't worry if the project name has to say Bumblebee Watch because you did an incidental rather than a point or roadside survey. Okay, so on that same uh, page, you're going to enter location information. You're going to name your site. You will find that uh, if you go back to the same site, you can recycle this and you should recycle the site name um, and it will easily populate uh, some of the information here. We want decimal, latitude, and longitude, uh, which will automatically populate if you use the map. You'll be able to explore that uh, yourself. Um, as you go through here, you're going to be transcribing data from your paper field sheet onto the website. So here we see we have to specify it was a point survey. Um, uh, I captured all of the bees that I saw as opposed to just capturing representatives of um, of the most common, uh, of each of the most common species, which is an alternative that you can explore. If you look at the project manual that um, I, I'll uh, leave it that for now for that. Um, we wanna know when you started, when you finished, things about the weather and so on. There's that habitat, uh, which you populate with a drop down menu. Uh, and then here's where you're going to enter your information about uh, signs of management and disturbance, native grazing, agriculture, insecticides, and so on. There's a notes field there, management notes, and then we enter the plant species. Uh, so this is this is just transcribing all of that data from the two um, from the from the habitat data sheet. You then get to this field, this page, 
where you're going to upload your photos. And it's quite easy to drag and drop them into that gray area, or you can ch hit choose files and go to the directory and get them. Um, again, you can upload up to five, and hopefully you'll upload one photo of the plant if it was collected from a plant. And here you see I have four photos. And in this particular field mission, I used tweezers to hold the bee so that I could get a good light on it. Um, you can see that in the background there. Uh, and you're specifying the, the floral host for this individual bee here. And you're gonna put in that it was a worker if you know that. Um, if you think it's female and you don't know if it's a worker or queen, there's an option for that. You're gonna guess at the species name. So here uh, we've put in Bifarius, also known as the two-form bumblebee. Um, if you aren't certain of the species, again, we, we don't need you to be an, an expert at identification now or in the future. Um, don't feel bad if you get it wrong or if you don't know and you have to guess. We will come through and, um, and check your work and we'll correct the species name as necessary. And there's no shame in not knowing how to identify these things now or at any time in the future. They are very hard to identify in some circumstances. So in sum, uh, we're going to be planning our survey, whether roadside or point survey. You will conduct that survey. You will enter your data in Bumblebee Watch. And hopefully you will do two surveys at least in your grid cell in 2022. We have an array of resources to support you. On this page, you see a picture of our website. Um, you see some of the materials that are available there, the project handbook, uh, these field forms. There's a little visual identification key in the bottom left-hand corner. And uh, you also see our private Facebook group here. Uh, these private Facebook groups have been really useful to the Atlas projects. Uh, so volunteers can talk to each other, share resources, and um, it's a nice community to have. So I encourage you to join our Facebook group. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram for this project. Um, and here are just a few of the identification resources, two field guides in the upper left-hand corner, a couple of digital resources, most importantly, Bumblebee Watch, bottom center but also something called iNaturalist, another called bugguide.net. These are places you can see photos of bees and distributions. And um, if you wanna go deep, this document is um, by that person, Robin Thorpe, who you heard about, um, a colleague, uh, and it is a wonderful 80s era, 1980s era uh, treatment of, of the bumblebees of California. It's outdated now, but it is excellent if you, if you really wanna understand these bees. I think there was one question I wanted to make sure we answered here. I think it's a really, really good question. Um, it says, um, do you have recommendations for social safety, particularly for BIPOC individuals? Are there credentials, identifying apparel, et cetera? Great question. Um, we uh, are producing a t-shirt, um, which uh, you could certainly wear, a California Bumblebee Atlas t-shirt. Um, it's not available yet, but will be soon. And um, that is something that you could wear. Rich is demonstrating the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas t-shirt. Um, <clears throat> we will probably over the course of the project have other swag that you could wear as a, you know, an identifying uh, mark that you're part of this project. Um, but beyond that, I would uh, suggest um, that um, if you are in a marginalized group or you feel for whatever reason that you may um, be less safe on the landscape doing this work, that you um, take whatever precautions you need to uh, take to do this work. Um, and that might unfortunately mean choosing field sites um, that are relatively safer than others. Um, but no, we, do, we don't have uh, extensive branding apparel, that sort of thing that you would um, wear or, or something that you would carry with you as an identifying mark. Rich, do you want to add to that? Yeah, there's a few things I would, <clears throat> I would say. Um, one is that LEAF will be offering, and Dylan will be offering a series of, of in-person um, field days throughout the state over in the coming months. And I think one of the benefits of those is the opportunity to meet somebody, you know, that that lives in your area that is also interested in these things and could be an opportunity to find a partner for you to be out in the field with or an ally or an advocate. Um, and that would be a nice opportunity to do that. I would also encourage you to use the private Facebook group for things like this. We've generally not 
um, just due to we don't we're not sure where people are with different privacy concerns. We're not we haven't played matchmaker <laughs> essentially ourselves to try to you know share contact information for people. But um, in the Pacific Northwest, we've had lots of opportunities where folks maybe haven't felt comfortable going out in the field, and they've you know posted um, you know in the Facebook page, hey, I live in this area and I want to go do surveys, but I don't feel like I could do it alone. And they've found partners and and now are working together to do surveys. So. Those would be other um, opportunities and options I would suggest for, for social safety issues. Um, and if there's any, do you have any ideas for us about ways that we could improve um, our recommendations and our communication about this? We would really welcome this. We're trying to develop and, and grow this aspect of our work and wanna make sure that this project is available for everybody. <clears throat> um, we're all benefiting from it and, and we should all be contributing to it, so please, please let us know if we can be helpful in any way. If I could add one quick thing there as well. Um, if you don't have a partner or aren't able to connect with someone that you can go out in the field with, um, we would highly recommend having someone back at home that you can check in with, someone that you can uh, make sure that they know where you're going and how long you'll be out and that you can text or call and just make sure that you get home safe um, and at least have someone know that uh, you are you're out and about in the field. Thanks, Dylan. Um, <clears throat> real quick question. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the question and answer it real quick. Um, I adopted a grid cell last year. Do I need to start over? No, you still have that grid cell adopted. You do not need to start over. Can grid cells be adopted by multiple volunteers? Yes, they can. At some point, we may close them off to try to encourage folks to spread out beyond sort of an individual grid cell, but particularly around urban areas. But for now, yes, multiple volunteers can 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 adopt the same grid cell. Uh, leave question here from uh, a participant. Do you think that the permit to work in the Franklin's range will be complete before May 15th? I just saw that question. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not able to answer it definitively. We just um, worked through this this week. Um, I'll, I won't bore you with the details of why we didn't know about this until this week, but sort of a technicality within the rules around uh, listing and recovery permit um, allocation. And so it's, it's a question of how, how quickly Fish and Wildlife Service biologists can work through the permits. Um, there's also a, they, they have to be published in, um, in the federal register. So not for each individual, but for the project itself. So I hope that by May 15th, we will be able to be working in those Franklin's grid cells, um, but it's possible it won't be till June that we're able to get in there. And I, I really apologize for that. Um, those are some of the most important parts of the state for us to do this inventory in, and we don't wanna limit anybody's ability to work there, but um, the, the purpose of listing a species as endangered obviously is to protect it from its extinction. And so this, this may seem bureaucratic, but it's it's really important for protecting what remaining populations exist. So, thanks for your patience there, and I will I will be responsive and uh, as quick as I can to to um, provide information about when it's open season in those those nine I think, nine cells. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add quickly that the Fish and Wildlife Service has acknowledged that survey effort is the number one important thing to to for Franklin's bumblebee is just finding it. So they don't want this to be a barrier to us and are working you know, quickly to try to expedite this through the process, but there's just certain regulatory hoops that are, are necessary when, in, in, you know, with federally endangered species. So um, yeah, certainly hopeful by May 15th, but no guarantees. <clears throat> okay, um, lots of other good questions here. Um, one in particular, if, we, well, there are a few questions that I'm gonna to try to combine here. Um, if I'm doing a survey and let's say uh, I'm near the coast and I see hundreds of say Bombus phosmosenskii or what look like Bombus phosmosenskii, do I need to capture them all, Leaf? <clears throat> yeah, great question. Um, and I alluded to this and I'm glad you, somebody's actually asked it. Uh, so, there are two ways to do these surveys, either uh, in a point survey, let's say, either you collect every BUC and you, you don't prejudice your collecting according to larger or more colorful or smaller, whatever it might be. The first time you see a B, you go after it. If you can get it, you get it, and then you move on to the next one. 
that type of collecting gives us a good sense of abundance um, and relative abundance. So how abundant is one species related to another because it's a random sample. So we can use statistics to um, analyze your data and we can really get a sense of who, which bees live in that area. Um, however, if 90% if of the bees are one easily identifiable species, easily to you, um, in Rich's example, Vosnesensky's bumblebee, um, you can definitely choose to just collect one of them for photo photographing and then keep a tally going in your head or on paper of how many you see while you're looking for other species. Then when you enter your data, actually when you enter your data on your paper field form and later at Bumblebee Watch, you will record the number of individuals you saw of that species. Um, it's impossible for us to know if you are correct that all of those animals you saw were the same Vosnesensky's bumblebee. So there's a little bit more potential for error there and we can't use the data in quite the same way for some analyses, but that is an absolutely acceptable way to do the work. So um, if you're familiar with the bees or the site, or even if you're not, if you're seeing nine out of 10 bees look exactly the same, you can choose to do that, uh, to just collect one of them and then go looking for different things. The only thing I would add there is just, um, if, you're, if you're really not, and maybe you said this, Steve, sorry, I was distracted. I was typing answer to another question, but if you're uncertain, you know, if it, if it could be, if there's a couple lookalike species, we recommend that you collect 10 of them. Um, and then you can move on to some other, to, to looking for different species, but usually, Let's say Bombus collagenosus and Bombus vosnesensky I look very similar and they're very hard to discern in the field. So we want to make sure to collect 10 of those to capture that diversity. Yeah, good point. Um, <clears throat> where do you recommend that people look for nets, Leaf? Yeah, uh, good question. So you do need a net. That's one of the only pieces of equipment that you're going to have to buy. Um, unfortunately, the best source for entomological nets is a business that has just closed. Um, it's called BioQuip. So uh, unfortunately, BioQuip is not an option, but there are many other places you can buy an, an insect net. Uh, Amazon carries a range of products. Uh, Carolina Biological Supply is a company that sells equipment for, um, for entomology, and that, that includes nets. Um, you could try searching the internet for um, entomological supplies or insect net. There are, there's a wide array of other um, um, businesses that sell these nets. Uh, so I'll leave it to you to find the, the others unless um, Rich wants to chime in with other businesses that you, you are thinking of. But let me just say first that um, what you want is uh, they come in a range of you know, sort of qualities. You could pay $20, you could pay $100 for the Cadillac net. <laughs> um, you want a net that's 12 to 15 inches in diameter. I prefer the 15 inch. Um, they get even bigger than this, but um, some of them come with a three foot long handle, some of them with a one foot handle. Uh, the, the longer handle will give you more uh, facility in the field with capturing these off of trees or in, um, when they're not right, right near you. Um, I don't think you need a fancy net. You should try for, for a, a decent good net. They're often referred to as student nets or something like that. Um, and then the other thing I wanna say about it is the bag, the part that the bee actually goes into comes in a range of materials or fabrics. And um, personally, I prefer the ones that are made of, a, it's a synthetic uh, plastic based material that looks like window screen, but a little bit finer mesh. Um, those do rip when they hit cacti and other thorny things, but um, you can see through them and you can see the, the insect and you're, it's safer for you and easier for you to get them into the net, into the vial. Uh, but you, you can find these bags made of muslin or canvas. That's fine if that's what you like, but personally, I don't think those are as easy to use as the, um, the other type. Leaf, in the interest of time, I think we should probably just leave it there. Um, so I'll, I'll try to work to type the answers to some of these as you go over identification. Yeah. And if I can't get to any or feel like typing an answer is insufficient, we'll, um, we'll maybe get to them at the end or, or send out uh, answers to these questions after the webinar is complete. 
Great. So, uh, so let's pick up where I left off and the next 12 slides are about environmental compliance and you'll hear from Dylan Winkler from CDFW. We will take any additional questions about Dylan's material and then we will move into the identification portion uh, directly after that. So Dylan, take it away and just let me know when I should advance the slide. Will do. Thank you for managing that, Leaf. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dylan Winkler again, um, and I'll be going over the environmental compliance portion of this uh, module. It's uh, some of the less interesting, but equally or just as important material. Um, and uh, the reason for this is that we want to minimize harm to bees, but also the plants and animals and the habitat we're going to survey on. Um, so some of the sections I'll cover are the Eagle Act um, to uh, avoiding sensitive habitat while surveying, um, other precautions while you're out in the field, um, some of the conditions for the scientific collecting permit that we're under, um, and some of the other uh, potential uh, risks uh, that we could carry in the field, such as rabbit hemorrhagic disease. Leaf, if you would. Thank you. So the Eagle Act is a state act that covers both bald and golden eagles. Um, both of these eagles are also protected on the federal level. Therefore, we want to ensure that uh, our bumblebee surveys um, associated with this at impact or associated with this atlas do not impact them negatively. So eagles incubate their eggs and fledge their young during the prime bumblebee survey. Oh, sorry. Um, loud noises or human presence can cause them to abandon their nests. So um, we want to avoid causing them any harm or stress while we're out in the field. Um, eagle nests are often made of sticks or branches, like you can see in these pictures. Um, golden eagle nests are more commonly found on cliffs, but they can occur in trees and on human-made structures. Uh, bald eagle nests are often usually in high treetops. All right, next slide, please. So for uh, golden eagles, uh, you want to maintain a, a buffer area of around one mile uh, away from their nest during the breeding season, which is around April through August. Um, so if you do encounter uh, a golden eagle nest while you're serving, please move at least a mile away. Um, if you encounter a nest, during the non-breeding season, which is around September to November, but you won't be serving much during that anyway. Um, you should move at least a half mile away. Um, for bald eagles, uh, they, may, they need uh, a smaller buffer around 330 feet or around a US football field size. Um, because it's hard to know whether an eagle may be present on the site, uh, it's best to always have a backup location or two when you're out surveying, uh, just in case you happen to encounter an eagle nest. Next slide. Bald and golden eagles occur over uh, wide swaths of the state, pretty much the whole state. Um, this isn't necessary, but if you don't have access online to the California Natural Diversity Database and you'd like more information about whether the location you're planning to visit has an active eel nest on it or not, um, you can contact me um, and I will look it up for you because uh, eagle nesting information is not generally available to the public. Um, but e even though we're offering this step, uh, it's not required as long as you move away from any nest that you do find. Um, we do ask that you report any nests that you find to us within three days of your survey. Um, that's really important information um, so we can verify it and record it in our database and hopefully maintain um, our recovery efforts for eagles. Um, so another aspect along with eagles and wildlife is um, treading lightly in sensitive habitats. Uh, we don't want to negatively impact any ecosystems while we uh, collect bumblebee data. The uh, survey methodology of photo documentation that LEAF went over um, was specifically designed to have a low impact which is why this project relies on pictures of bumblebees and flowers instead of specimens. Um, however, when you are sampling, it's important to be mindful of what's around you, especially when working in wetlands, riparian areas, or areas of rare or listed species. Uh, try your best to leave no trace. 
Next slide. Other precautions. I know LEAF has already covered a, a number of these points, but I want to make sure it's reiterated. Uh, be safe when you're outside. If you're going alone, please let someone else know uh, where you plan to travel and uh, when you plan to return. Um, try to consult with uh, people in the area about road surfaces and don't always rely on just a GPS or just Apple or Google Maps when planning. For example, many roads on forest service lands are narrow dirt roads um, and turning around on them can be a little hairy. Um, some roads may require four wheel drive or high clearance vehicles, just be prepared. Please also use extra care when sampling along roadsides. Um, be aware of blind corners. And if you feel unsafe in an area, just choose a different one. Um, don't work in areas that you could get injured in. It's also important to note that you have uh, permission to sample in these areas. Unless a private landover, landover gives you access, um, please stay on the rights of way or on public lands. Um, however, please note that many public lands do require permits while surveying, such as national and state parks, as well as uh, CDFW properties. If you're interested in surveying on uh, CDFW properties, uh, wildlife areas, um, and please contact me so I can get you a letter of access. Uh, we would love data from our own properties to contribute to uh, our management decisions. So just let me know. So uh, scientific collecting permits. Uh, in California, research that impacts species on our department's list of terrestrial invertebrates of conservation priority requires a scientific collecting permit. Um, this includes six species of bumblebees that we consider species of greatest conservation need. Um, Leaf went over this earlier and will again soon. Um, and Rich went over it too. Uh, and forgive me, I think I forgot Suckley's bumblebee on this. Um, there is one more that should be at the bottom. Um, but Franklin's, Western, Morrison's, Crotch's, Obscure or Fog Belted, and Suckley's. Um, the purpose of the scientific collecting permit is to develop a set of conditions that will help to ensure these species are not harmed as a result. Oh, yeah, I'll share my contact information at the very end. Um, I'll, I'll share my email. Um, it should be noted that for, oh, sorry, Leif, uh, could you, yeah. It should be noted that there are other pollinator species on the state list um, that you may inadvertently capture during your surveys. We don't expect you to be able to identify every species that you capture. Um, so we just want you to handle all species in your net in a cautious and careful way. Oh, thank you for sharing that, Rich. So collecting under the SCP, the scientific collecting permit, um, in order to be added to the permit, you need to adhere to a set of conditions we've agreed upon. The first of those is getting proper training, which is this webinar. Um, after you go through this training, and thank you everyone for being here, you'll need to pass a quiz on our website that demonstrates you've understood the key components of the survey protocol and how it was designed to minimize potential impacts to bumblebees. Uh, it will also review some of the conditions I'll go through now. Um, once you get approved on the permit, uh, you should read through the whole permit again, um, just to ensure that you understand it fully. And you also need to carry the permit, either printed out physically or uh, on your phone um, whenever you're sampling the field. Um, back to the quiz, once you take it, Circes will review your answers and then provide us with a list of approved of individuals to add to the permit. Um, they need to notify you that you've been added before you can start surveying. That's a really important point. So one of the key parts of the permit is that it does not authorize killing or harming the six uh, SGCN bumblebee species from the previous page. Um, as you'll learn in the next section, some of these species can be hard to tell apart. Leaf will go over identification in great detail. 
um, like common yellow face and the obscure bumblebee. Um, that's it's imperative to work with care when handling all bumblebee species. Again, the protocol is non-invasive and was designed to minimize potential harm to bees. If you accidentally catch another bee species in your net, which happens quite often, more than you'd expect, uh, be sure to release it after you've secured the target bumblebee in the vial. Uh, if you're able to identify an SGCN bumblebee species, which is again, not a requirement, um, that's why we have <laughs> uh, Rich and Leaf to ID the photos online. Um, please let us know within three days. Circes will also be letting us know as they ID your photos. Um, we may reach out to you um, to learn more about some of those detections. Um, the last point, other compliance needs uh, include cleaning your equipment between sampling locations. Leaf mentioned this was important uh, to keep the bees safe and uh, it definitely uh, has other uses too. Uh, we don't wanna spread pathogens to new locations when we survey. Um, one of those uh, pathogens uh, that we don't want to spread is uh, rabbit hemorrhagic disease, which is next slide. So rabbit hemorrhagic disease or rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus serotype two um, is a virulent and highly contagious uh, viral disease of lagomorphs, which include rabbits, uh, jackrabbits, hares, maybe pikas, oh, and domestic rabbits too. Oh, the uh, SGCN is species of greatest conservation need. Yeah. Um, back to the uh, rabbit hemorrhagic disease, it has high mortality rates for rabbit populations. Um, uh, it can be transmitted through contact with infected lagomorphs or their blood, feces, or other contaminated objects or the environment. Um, the virus is hardy and can remain viable on the meat the fur, clothing, or equipment that came in contact with contaminated uh, sources for up to 15 weeks. Um, the virus doesn't pose a health risk to humans or any other wildlife other than lagomorphs, um, but humans and other animals can inadvertently spread the virus. Um, to comply with our scientific collecting permit, you must incorporate safety measures into your fieldwork protocol to slow the spread of the virus um, and help inform disease tracking and management. So the main uh, two points are do not touch, move, salvage um, lagomorphs or their carcasses or feces. Um, if you work in an area where there has been a known virus occurrence um, or encounter sick or dead uh, rabbits or hares, um, please disinfect your boots and gears with a fresh 10% bleach solution. Um, you can carry uh, non-diluted bleach with you and then mix it in the field and just like dip the bottom of your boots in it for uh, a few minutes. Um, and if any of your nets or vials come in contact with the ground, um, please bleach them as well. It was detected in San Benito County in January of this year. So just be aware of that. And then this map viewer from the USDA is a good resource to check if there's any recent uh, reportings. Uh, next slide. Um, another, uh, a few conditions under the SCP. Um, in terms of salvage, which is our term for collecting an already dead specimen of bees, um, you are able to do this. You're able to collect a bee if you find it already dead. Um, we first ask that you photograph it so we have a sense of its condition. Please report the latitude and longitude of where it was found, as well as the date you found it, uh, time, other relevant details, such, um, including the probable cause of death, if you can venture a guess. You'll wanna place it in the freezer until Xerces or CDFW can provide you information on what to do next. Hopefully you won't, won't, you won't find too many dead bumblebees while you're out. Um, certainly if you note a mass poisoning, such as uh, what Rich reported with the linden trees in Oregon, um, please let us know as soon as possible. Um, we'll also need to report it to our 
Wildlife Labs uh, mortality reporting database, which is the same database that you would report uh, a dead or sick rabbit or hare if you found one. Um, if you accidentally kill a bee in the course of your work, then you need to report this to us as well. You need to stop serving at that location, um, which is defined as two miles from the point that you're serving at um, and move away until you uh, receive direction on us about how to proceed. Next slide. Uh, one final special note about the Franklin's bumblebee. Uh, Leaf already uh, mentioned this, but I just want to reiterate it. Um, since Franklin's was listed as endangered last year, um, it needs to be uh, surveyed under a federal recovery permit. Um, and we are working on um, getting that permit, but at the moment, um, we are not able to survey in uh, those Northern counties uh, and those Northern cells that you can see on this map in yellow. Um, that being said, once we do uh, get the permit, uh, we would love for you to survey in those areas. We're really hoping this bee is rediscovered because um, that would aid in its recovery efforts. Um, at any rate, please remember that the protocol um, we use is designed to minimize harm to bees and other wildlife. So please carefully follow the protocol. And that's it for environmental compliance. Um, here's my email again and my supervisor, Hillary. She's the pollinator coordinator at CDFW. Um, contact either of us with questions. And if you or your organization are interested in applying for a scientific collecting permit for another research project, um, I've provided links to those program pages um, in the application portal as well. All right, thank you, Dylan. Uh, let's let's have there's time for just a couple of questions. Um, yeah. I'm going to answer the first one uh, just quickly. So, any chance we could get a PDF of the slides? It would be easier to get the links from the PDF than to have to look them all up. Um, and I will just answer that yes, we can produce a PDF that we can uh, we can post to our website. Um, but also, just so everyone knows. We're recording these this um, this webinar today, and within about a week, this will be posted to the Xerces Society channel on YouTube, where you can watch it as many times as you would like. Um, somebody who has not been able to uh, join the webinar can can do their own training at their own pace, um, and you can get all of those links in that way also. So, um, Dylan, could you, uh, somebody asked um, any guidance on effectively cleaning nets? Do you wanna take that? Yeah, um, so for compliance with the, the rabbit hemorrhagic disease, uh, bleach is best, 10% bleach solution. Um, some, some resources say that might damage the net based on um, its material. Um, but if you're only doing a survey twice, um, then maybe just a couple bleaches will be fine. Um, I carry a spray bottle on my car, um, which I can mix uh, bleach and water in and just spray it on the net material. But um, I also have a little tray bucket that I use to uh, set my boots in to soak the bottoms. And you can also nestle your net in. And if your net comes with like a removable um, bag, which most should, then you can you can remove it and settle it in for ten minutes or so. Great, thank you. Uh, there are more questions, more good questions, um, but in the interest of time, I think we should move on to the fourth module and. Yeah. Uh, the remaining questions, we can answer more at the end, and also um, we can get back to you directly if you uh, wouldn't mind following up with an email or a similar. Um, if you have a question we weren't able to answer um, uh, during this presentation. 